Welcome back, Wire Monkeys, to another episode of Let's Talk Cabling. This episode, we're talking about the imperative trinity that would be space, electrical, and pathways. Welcome to the show where we tackle the tough questions submitted by installers, estimators, IT personnel. We are connecting at the human level so that we can connect the world. If you're watching this podcast on YouTube, would you mind hitting the subscribe button and the bell button to be notified when new content is being produced? If you're listening to us on one of the audio podcast platforms like Stitcher or Google or one of the other ones, would you mind leaving us a five-star rating? Those simple little steps helps us take on the algorithm so we can educate, encourage, and enrich the lives of people in the ICT industry. Thursday night, 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. What are you doing? I do a live stream on LinkedIn, Facebook, TikTok, YouTube, and eventually Instagram, where you get to ask your favorite RCDD, well, of course you know that's going to be me, your questions on installation, certification, design, project management, even career path questions. But I can hear you now. But Chuck, I'm driving my truck at 6 p.m. I don't want to get into an accident. That's okay. They are recorded. And you can watch them on our website at letstalkcabling.com. This content is free of charge and will always be free of charge. But if you would like to support this channel, make sure you click on this QR code right here where you can buy me a cup of coffee. You can schedule a 15-minute one-on-one call with me, after hours, of course, or find other ways to support me as well. And finally, we're also always accepting corporate applications for sponsorship to this for our mission. So if your company if your company background is to educate, encourage, and enrich, hit me up on one of the social media platforms, and let's make that work. So I was alerted to an article in ICT Today. For those who may not know what that magazine is, it's a magazine produced by Bixie quarterly with the sole purpose of providing technical information, pertinent vendor vendor independent and authoritative knowledge for people in the information communication technologies. You might have to be a member to receive it, but I'm not 100% positive of that. So I got alerted to this article that was on in the, the current edition, and the article was titled, The First Three Essential Considerations of Technology and Information Transport Design and Planning. So I was like, that sounds like a good article. And it was written by somebody whom I met two years ago at a Bixie conference, and I swear we, we talked... We got talking with one of those round tables outside one of the conference room there, and uh, we got to talk, and we totally missed the whole next session. <laughs> but, you know, hey, I'm, I'm a chatty Kathy, and that's just the way it is. So the author of that article was Justin Hobbs. Justin Hobbs is an RCDD and a Bixie technician, and I love his, his LinkedIn profile because he says he's a director, a mentor, a planner, and an executioner of Layer 1. Uh, I just love that. That's just absolutely cool. So... Welcome to the show, Mr. Justin. How you doing, my friend? I'm doing well, sir. How are you? Not too bad. I do have to ask you one question before we get going. What is CM and ACE? I saw that in your profile. Yes, sir. Those are aviation industry-specific certifications. So CM stands for a Certified Member of the AAAE, and the ACE is, a, is an Airport Certified Employee. Um, the ACE program encompasses many different facets of the aviation industry, but uh, my my particular one is in um, airside operations. So I'm a, I'm an I'm an aviation guy, but obviously you know RCDDs can't be uh, anchored to one particular industry. We gotta we gotta kind of uh, we kind of gotta be masters of all or jack of trades of all. Jack of all trades. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. And and you can still I love aviation. I mean I I grew up. Well, I grew up loving planes, not around planes. And uh, one of my sons now is an airline pilot. He flies for, well, actually, he's, he's not an airline pilot now. Now he flies for Atlas, which is. Atlas is a, it's a cargo transport company. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. 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 so if, if he flies the 757 all over the place. He, and he used to fly for Delta, but he's like, Dad, packages don't complain. I was like, okay. That's true. Yeah, yeah, so I like that. I was like, wait a minute. Is your flying bad that they're complaining, or you just are customers just unreasonable in their expectations? No, inanimate objects do not complain. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So, welcome to the show, my friend. Finally got you on. 
Um, why don't you give us the uh, the brief introduction of uh, of who you are, your background, and uh, and your certifications? Yeah, so I started in technology like when I was eight years old. Um, I started messing with computers, things like that. My dad retired from uh, used to be Duke Power, now Duke Energy Incorporated uh, uh, here in North Carolina. Um, and him bringing home the newfangled technology uh, years ago kind of got me interested. Um, so him and my uncle went to Charlotte to a custom shop um, to get a custom built computer. And this was back in the 80s. And from then, you know, it just kind of got me interested in technology. Uh, I used to get my rear end uh, whooped for messing with daddy's computer. Uh, but he had all these books to go with it, and it, it taught me. Uh, I read these books, and it taught me how to fix the computer before he got home so I wouldn't get my tail end whooped. Um, and from there, it just kind of just expanded. And I, and I did, you know, various other things. I had a, a, a company one time where I fixed computers, did uh, PC support, and this is when things were really starting to cook. Um, just out of a need of a job, I started with a, a local company that did Layer 1 um, cabling installation, and that's where uh, that's what landed me today. Um, from there, I, you know, I worked in all industries, you know, from um, education to military to obviously aviation, um, healthcare, you know, just about every industry that was out there. Um, proud to say that I was part of a, a huge multi-billion dollar project for the United States Marine Corps at Camp Lejeune. Um, it was over 40 buildings that we did down there. I um, also have done some work for the uh, Federal Bureau of Investigation here in Charlotte. Um, did one of their um, new buildings and it was a, a passive optical uh, installation. That was before PON really became popular, before it really became a, a big deal. Um, aviation, you know, we worked at the airport um, here in Charlotte for a long time. Lucked up, got a job there. I worked there for almost 10 years. Uh, and then from there, I'm, now I'm in healthcare. You know, but that's just what it is. So I am an RCDD. Um, I'm a tech. I became a tech first. And I believe, in my opinion, my humble opinion, that being a, a field technician first is going to make you a better RCDD than just oh, obviously going I, through that yes. track. Absolutely. 100% agree with that. Yeah. And Absolutely. I, uh, I'm proud to say that there's um, several guys out there, several folks out there that are getting ready to take their RCDD, um, have achieved their technician, you know, from you know, a mentorship from me, not not necessarily through the Bixie program, but just one on one. I've I've had the pleasure and the honor of working with these guys and other folks, uh, ladies too, and I'm just excited for them to uh, to progress themselves just as much as I have. Um, there was an RCDD that I, I want to uh, call out. His name was Paul Ratcliffe. Um, he was a wonderful, very intelligent guy. He was a wonderful mentor to myself. He passed away, I think, in 2018, uh, pancreatic cancer. And I would not be where I am today if not for him. So posthumously, uh, I want to say kudos to Mr. Ratcliffe. Uh, but from there, you know, obviously, here I am now with a with a health care organization. I can't say what it is, of course, due to um, policy, but HIPAA I'm, in all that. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not going to ask you to get into that. That's like my day job. I don't I don't say who I work for. You know, um, it's not hard to figure out, but I don't I don't put it out there because the podcast is a totally separate entity, which is why the recording is at 6 p.m. and not during the day because I, right. I, I got to do it separately. Um, just want to touch base on that mentorship thing real quick before we move on to the questions. I was fortunate to have a, a mentor too. Um, unfortunately, it wasn't until I was about 20 years into my career. But I tell you what, once once he started mentoring me, man, I tell you what, my career it just went into hyperdrive, and that's one of the reasons why I'm a, a super big advocate of mentoring people. And, and I, I did it to give back, but then I didn't realize that I was going to get a lot out of it being a mentor. You know, because, yeah. you know, you just, you, there's a lot that you get out of it when, when you do so. For those who are listening, if you're thinking about being a mentor, you should do it. Just if you've been on the fence, just do it. Um, and you can be a mentor or mentee with with two years experience or 42 years of experience, because there's always somebody who doesn't know what you know. And, and mentorship is really just helping them to kind of get along for that. For thing. Let me ask you about the article. What was the driving force that made you decide to write that article? Well, first off, it was it, the driving factor was being in all these, you know, construction meetings, things like that, and always coming up against the same 
challenges with architectural engineering firms um, and SMEs themselves. And that was, you know, that was the driving force behind it. And that was the reason why I decided to write it. I was like, I'm beating my head against the wall, you know, why not write something about it? You know, maybe it was venting, you know, on a piece of paper. Um, but I was always coming up against the same things. And that was with my aviation career. That was, you know, with my current career. And just in general, even as my time as, a, as an installation technician, you know, I saw the same things over and over and over and over and over. And the architects, engineers, and consultants never, ever seemed to, to get it. And so I said, well, I'll just write something about it just to get it off my chest, number one. Number two, maybe it'll make a difference somewhere. Yeah, I was um, this week's show. I interviewed uh, um, one of the one of the guests was Carol Everett Oliver, and she writes all kinds of articles. And she wrote an article years ago, years ago, called "The Cat Is Out of the Bag," and it it just kind of gives the history of you know the the Annixter's levels programs, how that morphed into the categories of Category Three, Five, E Six, and all that stuff. And and even though she wrote that years ago. I still, to this day, get questions from people about asking about category cable and stuff, and I send them that article. I, I, after reading your article, I think it's going to have the same evergreen effect because just like you said, we're always beating our head against the same challenges, it seems like. You know, it, it just it is. Let me ask you this. Um, how long did it take you to write that article, and how hard was the submission process to getting into that Bixie ICT today? Well, because I had been thinking about it for such a long time, it, it really only took me about a month. Um, the writing process is one of those things that you do a brain dump, you just write everything. Just write it. It doesn't matter what it is. Just write it down. And then constantly go back, reread what you have written. Don't do it in the same day. Step away from it. Reread it. Go back through it and go, is this really what I'm trying to, to say? You know. Um, so it took me about a month to write it. Um, if I'm being honest, uh, where some it may take more. Um, but the submission process was not that challenging, believe it or not. And it's, I guess it's because that I took the time to actually write the article and go through it and constantly revise it, try to polish it myself. And then I worked with a really great editor who came back to me and said, look, um, for readability and, and continuity type of aspects, here's what you need to do. And it was great to work with them. It was um, a third-party vendor, I think, Bixie hires to do a oh, lot okay. of the publication. Yeah. That's very so, cool. Yeah, uh, really nice lady. She worked with me, um, went through, edited everything, helped me, um, provided some really good positive feedback. Um, most of what you, you read in the article is, you know, a, a lot of what I originally wrote you know, with some minor modifications. Uh, as far as graphics, you know, they, they went and said, look, we really want some graphics with it because graphics help you know, catch the eye and do things like that. And in my own opinion, um, uh, I wrote the article. It's 100% me, but I used um, some new AI type of features like with uh, Canva or something like that just to generate some um, some graphics because I couldn't find any graphics. I looked for graphics, and I couldn't find anything that would actually help me convey what I was talking about. And so I did play with a little bit of AI there, but the writing is 100% me. There's nothing wrong with AI. I mean, I use AI... No daily uh, with the podcast. Um, for example, writing a description for the show. When I upload the audio podcast, the platform that I use creates a transcript, and then AI will write a description off of that transcript. Now, I could easily write the, I could easily write the description, but it does it in literally like seconds, right? And, and I'm busier than a one-legged man in a butt kicking contest. So you know what? I'll take that and run with it. I'll yeah. take that and run. You, you got to proofread it. Anything, anything with a, with AI, you got to proofread. Yeah. But you know, and that goes. But that goes with anything. I mean, even like you said, you had a proofreader helping you. I had. A, I took a college class once, and the uh, it was on writing. And so that the, they told us we had to write a 1,500 word paper, three pages. So I think no, yeah, it was seven, no, it was two pages, 750 words a page whatever subject we could pick the subject and so we turned it in so then the next week assignment was you had to cut it down to a thousand words and then the next week you had to cut it down to 500 words and then the last week we had to cut it down to 250 words 
And I'll tell you what, that just it opened my eyes when it comes to writing things. It, it just absolutely did. And I think, well-written article, kudos to you. Lots of great points. Um, there, there was a word in there that I actually had to go look up. I didn't know what it was. I was, I was like, what the heck is that? And I had to go... I had to go to the old Google machine and type it to find out what it was. Because I'm just a knuckle-dragging cable guy. Right? Well, so am I. But, yeah, but you knew that word. What the heck is that all about? Making making an RCDD feel bad. Right? Well, I'm not what, trying to make you feel bad, dude. Uh, you know, hey, I, I, I read other articles. I read other books. And, you know, every now and again, I pick up this fancy word. You know, right. I grew up in the, in the country, too, you know, working in a garden. Every now and again, I pick up a fancy word. Right. Oh yeah, absolutely. There you go. But you don't have to. You don't have to talk afterwards about guards because you know I have a farm, and we've got pigs, ducks, geese, chickens, fifteen garden beds, aquaponics. Uh, we got lots of stuff going on in the property. Yeah, we weren't that in- fancy, man. We we had a nineteen fifty Alice Chalmers B series tractor and, and a two acre farm. We grew corn and pumpkins and and cucumbers and all, that's what we did. And we canned vegetables and stuff, and that's what we ate. I'm only three acres. I'm only three acres, and uh, we harvested two pigs two weekends ago, I think, something like that. Yeah. And we're canning stuff as well, too. But that's that's beside the point. Um, one, one of the things you said in the article, you, you talked about the imperative trinity. Imperative trinity. Mm-hmm. I thought that was that – was, did you come up with that term, or was that something that's been out there? No, I, I just, it just came off the top of my head. I was like, you know, what are the three most important things that I always find in every single conversation, every single project – what are the three most important things that I always identify when working on a project? And I wrote it specifically for, I would say, new folks, um, young RCDDs, new folks in the industry, um, technicians, uh, folks that are looking to get into designing. I wrote that specifically for them, not necessarily for the folks that have been in the industry for a long time, but I was it was it was something that I decided, you know, pass some some tidbits of knowledge on to the newer generation something that i've learned and that's exactly the same way i want to conduct these interviews you know I, the the interview is the whole podcast is for the emerging professionals who are wanting to learn hungry to learn i do have people who, who listen to the show they've got 30 40 years 50 years as an rcd okay great fine because you can always learn something even from somebody like me but the show's really geared towards those emerging professionals, and, and that article is absolutely written towards that. Absolutely, because when I was one of the, when I was reading your article, the, the the thing that the general feeling I got out of it was, you didn't say, okay, here here's the problems, spaces, electrical pathways, but you didn't say here's the answers to those. You you actually, I like how you did this. You posed questions in the article to get the reader to think about the things, and I was like. Man, that's, I just love that. And one of the questions you put on there is, uh, um, what does what what does technology require more than anything in space? And you gave a compelling argument on how the how people will tell you that the you know the equipment's getting smaller, the cable's getting smaller. Um, if that's the case, what do you think is the driving force from the customer's perspective when they're you know that that they think they don't need as much space? Yeah. So. A lot of these architects, engineers, consultants, they might read a, a, a short um, form article and they think they're experts on something. And uh, all, you know, all truth aside and, and inclusive, I've got some friends that are great architects. I've worked with some great architects. I've worked with some great engineers. Um, some of them really get it. Some of them really don't. Um, case in point, I worked with, a, with an engineer that told me that I had to have four feet of clearance in front of my telecom room door due to ADA, and I had to politely remind them that, well, pursuant to um, Section 203.5, um, telecom rooms and uh, telecom or communication equipment rooms are uh, exempt from ADA, you know, unless there's a specific need. But anyway, so I digress. So what's requ- the driving factor for more space? It's not necessarily more space, but the standards that we uphold and that we try to enforce give us room to work with. The biggest thing is that we as technology uh, designers, advisors, subject matter experts, we don't have this magic crystal ball that tells us what technology is coming out five years, 10 years, 15, 50 years from now. We don't have that. We wish we did. All of us that have been in this industry, we wish we knew what, what, was the latest, greatest, next big whiz bang thing. 
we don't have it. But with space, we can be future resistant. I'll never say future proof because there is no such thing. But I will say future resistant. With space, we have possibilities. With space, coming from an end user who has been in the trenches as an end user, a customer for years in, in technology groups, space allows for um, changes in technology, graceful changes in technology. Um, working at a, a 24-7, 365, you know, airport, you know, one of the busiest airports in the world, I'll say that, Charlotte Douglas International, I can say that now because I don't work there, one of the busiest airports in the world, we couldn't do changes during the day, obviously not, because that's when the passengers are flowing through, and, and obviously nobody wants to be late for their flight. So all of our changes had to be within a very short window, and that was typically four or five hours, and that's it. That's all we got. So we had to uh, adjust ourselves accordingly to, to fit within that window. So space allowed us to install new equipment, power it up, do some testing to make sure it's going to work, and then do gradual, graceful cutovers to this new equipment. And we wouldn't have that without space. And I'm talking about rack space. If you don't have rack space, then you have to add something, a new rack space. And you don't have the space for that, then you're, then you're doing this hot cut during the middle of a production hour or you're having to scramble or do this intensive planning, it costs more money. It costs a ton more money to have to do all this in, in, in intrusive planning, intrinsic planning, as opposed to being able to go, all right, we're just going to put this new equipment in. we got a place to put it. It can sit there. It can cook. We can test it. We can play with it and be done with it. Yeah, because that way if you have an out-of-box failure – it's it's it, well it's in the rack before you've turned it up and gone live with it, and it's much easier and less impact. And by the way, let me say, um, I've flown through Charlotte Airport many many times. Thank you for making not not, not letting us get delayed going through the airport. I'm just gonna say that, <laughs> put that out there because I go through there. I'm I'm going through there next week. I brought I, through, I, I I can toot my own horn on this. I brought the concept of zone enclosures to that airport. So if you walk through one of the concourses, you look up and you see a zone enclosure in the ceiling. You're welcome. There you, there you go. There you go. So in the uh, in the Bixie Best Practice Manuals, the TDMM, the Telecom Distribution Methods Manual, it talks about sizing the telecom room and also talking about for futures bus. Do you feel that those recommendations made by Bixie are sufficient enough, or should they be even bigger than what the Best Practice Manuals recommend? Well, for general, like, commercial use, Bixie does a great job. I mean – it's one of those things where Bixie doesn't have a crystal ball either. So they they have to put something on paper. And what they've done has worked out great for a long time, you know. Um, my experience with aviation, and in aviation, if you've seen one airport, you've only seen one airport. You know, at different airports do different things differently. So um, Charlotte at Charlotte, we built rooms bigger than what was industry standard. Why? Because they were a co-located room. Next article, by the way. Nice. Yeah. Uh, some other airports, um, instead of installing separate physical infrastructure for different airlines and different entities, they would use, they would leverage their um, network, um, their layer two, layer three stuff, and actually give the airline or the vendor, you know, like a, a layer two, layer three connection there for their network so they would cut down on their space requirements it's really dependent on what the use case is but by and large to answer your question i think what they're doing is great it's the best they can do with what they got there is no one size fits all for any industry but for commercial yeah they got it um in healthcare, you know we're looking um at partnering with like um fgi which is um, uh, was it Facilities Guidelines Institute, which is a an organization similar to Bixi, but it's more geared on the architecture side, and they partner with the AIA, which is Architects. Um, the beautiful thing about FGI is they actually reference Bixi materials. Oh, nice. Yeah. Nice. So the the nice. Bixi standard for healthcare organizations is actually working very well, at least for the organization I'm involved with. And some of the others that I have peers with in other organizations, um, they actually uh, size the rooms bigger, and for good reason because 
healthcare has a lot more systems. Yeah, there's a there's a standard for uh, commercial buildings, standard for residential, standard for industrial plants, a standard for healthcare facilities. Do you think that aviation? There you go. There you go. Exactly. Do you think the aviation because because it's a critical infrastructure? Do you think there's enough of a requirement there for a standard on just aviation facilities? Absolutely. Yeah, there's there's a good there's there's some fodder for Bixie to chew on because I know they listen to the show. So, yeah, and and to be uh, to be fair to Bixie, you know they have uh, some publication that deals with like special installations and some of aviation is kind of in there. Um, but I think it's worth it to visit aviation as a different um, entity um, because. I mean, in my experience, I got to see um, various different uh, airports like Denver. Denver has a great, great infrastructure model. They really do. Um, Charlotte, we built something specific to that type of market. Uh, Atlanta is different. Uh, yeah, every every major airport is different. They have a different way of doing things. But I think there's some commonalities between all of them that could help. One of the things you said in your in your article and I'm quoting directly from the article, it says, architectural firms, facility owners, and operators, space means revenue generation. So remember, remember that we're gearing this show towards the emerging professionals. First, define what is revenue generating, okay? And how can the technician, the Bixie technician or the RCDD clear that hurdle? Yeah, so does your business require technology to work? That's the first question, and I would say, Nine times out of ten, the answer is going to be yes. So, okay, yes, it requires technology to work. So where are you going to put this technology that gives you your space? How critical is it that gives you your other things like electrical, path, you know, it, it, it's all cascading. Mm -hmm. And then what happens when it doesn't work? Right. Yeah, so exactly. Is it is it somebody just doesn't get their their – triple latte mocha whatever or is it or is there airplanes in the sky that are burning thousands of dollars of fuel because they can't land yes i can tell you with 100 percent certainty that the faa is very clear on all their facilities that they say they have nice big placards on their facility that says failure for this equipment to operate can result in loss of human life yep <laughs> that's, oh, pretty, wow. that's, that's pretty that's pretty poignant there. for you there's yeah. a reminder for you. I, I did uh, I did a project once out at uh, at Greater Orlando International Airport, also known as Goa. Goa, and, yes. Uh, so I remember I had to go through specific training and a background check just to be able to get you know to do work and go because we were doing antennas outside of the building and stuff. And I do remember the one thing I specifically. And this is we're talking ten years ago. The one thing I specifically remember about that they said, if you cross an active runway, and you cause problems. I think it was like a fifteen thousand dollar fine or something. It was some huge amount of dollars. It's a huge amount of dollars. Um, you can get a lot of trouble for impacting air air operation. Yes, you can. Yep. yep. So but you, you, in, in the healthcare realm, it's the same way. Imagine if you well, Chuck were a patient laying on an operating table, and the the surgeon that was working on your case all of a sudden could not use that Da Vinci robotic. Um, Surgical apparatus, you know, it, that's a pretty big deal. What if they couldn't see those um, X-ray scans, those CT scans, right. you know, because obviously um, PAC systems, things like that, they're very, very important. So what if they couldn't do that? Right. They couldn't do their job, and you as the patient could be laying on this table and expire. Yeah, and then I was, I was talking to um, Jeff Beavers at NECA. I went to the Beeks, NECA Bixie Summer in Denver, by the way. Um, like six months ago, and um, we were talking about the convergence of technology in hospitals and healthcare. And what, and I didn't know this until he told me about it. But evidently, there's they're doing remote surgeries now with high, with with you know touch sensitive equipment stuff. Can you imagine if the network goes down in the middle of that? That's exactly right. Yeah, that's so. exactly right. And the patient experience, you know, right now hospitals are starting to migrate themselves closer towards like your experience at a high end you know, resort. 
you know, right now what what a lot of hospital systems, a lot of healthcare systems doing, they're migrating to this this patient experience platform where there's, uh, let's say, an iPad or some sort of tablet or some sort of screen outside your room that has your room number, has your um, touch precautions, your contact precautions, any specialties that you need so that anybody that comes into your room knows 100% without a doubt this is what you need before you come in this room. Also, within the room, you have this nice big screen. You know, it'll have your name on there. It'll be like, hey, good morning, Chuck. You know, how's your pain level today? And you can, you have a little tablet bedside where you can say, oh, my pain is this. Um, and it has, like, your, your uh, plan of care that day. You can stream content, like your favorite show, your movie, or local news. You can do all that through this one platform um, and it also integrates with this thing called you know we, we know it as telehealth have, if you've never done telehealth you know obviously you, you, i have i have yeah. done tele well i didn't do it i was with my son and uh and i swear it was like i don't, I don't know if you're a big bang theory person i mean i, I love big that bang theory yeah so remember when sheldon was going around with the with the cart with the tv screen on it and he was talking it was exactly like that i mean they yeah. brought the cart in and they said, okay, this is telehealth. The doctor will be on a minute. They turn it on. And we're just kind of sitting there talking. All of a sudden, bloop, she comes on. She goes, hey, Jonathan, how you doing? Because it was actually for my son, not for me. I was like, and I was, all, all I could see was Sheldon, you know, the whole yeah. time. Well, that's becoming a big thing now. Uh, I mean, the healthcare system I'm part of, we're, we're putting this in all of our hospitals now. There's a green button on the wall. If you need to talk to a doctor right then and now, you smash the button. Camera turns around, points at you. Screen comes up. Hey, Chuck. What's going on? How can I help you? You know, and then it all it all integrates with the electronic medical record system so that everything is is there in one spot and transfers from physician to physician. So there's nothing lost. So it's all designed to help you as the patient. So you as the patient in the healthcare industry are revenue generating. Right. Oh, yeah, the, absolutely. You absolutely. know, and, the, and then the customer, the uh, the flyer, the frequent flyer is going to be the, the, the revenue flyer. generation there. The person um, coming cool. into the coffee shop, your revenue right. generating. That right. technology is revenue generating. Period. So, so like a non just just for clarification and, and correct me if I'm wrong. You since the last example you gave me was coffee shop. I don't drink coffee, but so if I walk into a Starbucks, the revenue generation space would be in front of the counter and right behind the counter, right? It wouldn't necessarily be the the manager's office in the back, would it? Why wouldn't it? I don't know. I'm asking you. The, well, the manager is part of the organization. The manager helps the organization function. If the manager can't see the data, process the orders, the uh, get the the additional um, uh, what is it, the coffee, the supplies. If they can't if they can't order what they need to make the operation run, how can the business run? Even the front of house space is like if you're sitting in the lobby there. Even if you're just there, you're not drinking coffee, but you're sitting there. And you're on your laptop, you're on your phone, or whatever. You might actually go, you know what? I'm thirsty. I'm gonna go over here. I'm gonna get this. I'm gonna get this cup of coffee. Or oh wow, that that cake pop looks pretty good. Or that sandwich looks pretty good. You you might spend five six dollars. Even you sitting in there, on the Wi-Fi that's attached to the same technology system that's in that same technology room, you're revenue generating. Are you following me around when I'm traveling? Because no, that's sir. exactly what happens to me. <laughs> I'll sit down. I'll crack open the laptop. I'll be looking at emails, and then all of a sudden I'll my, my one of my uh one of my um one of my one of the things i have challenges with is uh auntie ann's soft pretzels those are good oh yeah yeah as a matter of fact, i was flying back i was coming back um from uh baltimore last weekend and i stopped at the auntie ann's at in, in the bwi airport and i had my my let's talk cabling shirt on and they're like he goes what's that and i said it's a podcast he goes give us a shout out so auntie ann's in bwi airport here's your shout out there but yeah, go. I mean the, the the smell of that thing is just like, oh man, I gotta go have one. The brown you sugar know? and cinnamon uh, pretzel bites, yes. Uh huh. I'm with you. Uh, no, I don't do those. I love doing just the, the just the regular pretzel with the salt. I mean, that's still good. Oh yeah, 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 absolutely. So the the second one you talked about was uh, electrical. Yeah, you know, the second part of the Trinity was electrical. And you said in your article and again, I'm quoting this. You know, it says uh, what electrical service will be installed or is already present. So my question is. Is the average power supply delivered by the utility ever enough? That's the first part of the question. And then the second part of the question is, um, what? How could a 
junior designer or tech or, or project manager, what can they do to present some options because I'm telling them, no, hey, that, that, that current power is not going to be enough. So all your major utilities are going to publish their um, their nines of reliability. They're going to publish it, you know, publicly. So utilities are usually anywhere between four to six nines of reliability. Um, the one I have here in North Carolina is Duke Energy, obviously, and they publish five nines of reliability. Uh, not at my house, of course. Uh, in the past month, we've been out like four or five times. So, yeah. But anyway... It all depends on what are your, your nines of reliability. It also depends on how critical is technology to your operation. If you have a tolerance for, I don't know, 30 minutes, an hour, two hours, two hours uh, without your technology systems, then utility power is probably going to be just fine, and it's not that big a deal. But you still have to have power. All technology takes power. doesn't matter. You gotta have power. You gotta have power to turn the lights on. You have power to run your air conditioning system. You have power to, you know, whatever your stove, your, your anything. You don't have power. You don't have a business. You don't have nothing. Yeah, I, that's, I, I get the same issue because I live in the country, and if if the uh, if if one of my dogs has flatulence in the backyard, that causes my power to go down. Sometimes it feels like it's because we live in the country. You know, it's, yeah. it is what it is. You know, yeah, yeah, there you go. Yeah. One of the great one one of the greatest quotes that I think that you had in your article was pathways create flexibility. I love that. Love mm -hmm. that. Um one of the biggest not necessarily debates, but one of the biggest things that I think maybe the emerging professionals don't really grasp well is future proofing. I know you don't like that term future proofing, but and I'm saying if you, what I mean by that is if you're putting in a J hook, maybe go with a little bit bigger J hook because it's easier to do it on the first day compared to I like you said compared to day 1000 I, I love that I like right. when you said day 1000 I love that right um, so what are some tips that you could give that Bixie Tech or that RCDD that they can institute to make their pathway still viable at day 1000 I'll use one key term and it's the term empathy think about those that are coming after you period. Uh, you may or may not be the person that are going to be back in that same space a year from then, five years, ten years. It doesn't matter. Think about that person that is coming after you. A lot of folks don't do that. Like Just putting in a piece of string in a tray. People don't seem to want to do that because they're like, well, it'll just spiral up. Well, there's, there's tricks of the trade to prevent that. We all know that. You can do that. You can learn that. Um, but just putting in, put in a piece of string you know, something, have that empathy. So yes, pathways create flexibility. If you have enough pathway to get a piece of cable in or something, you would be surprised the worlds that open up. I mean, in my my experience at an airport that's been in operation since, I don't know, the 30s, uh, 20s, or, you know, whatever the history is of the airport, if I could get a piece of fiber somewhere, that opened up a huge world of pop possibilities huge and with the way technology is now you know with passive um, optics with um, um, coarse wave division multiplexing even dense wave you can do things passively using different optics um, you can do things with one strand as opposed to two you know uh, we that's something that we piloted and tried out at the airport where we didn't have enough fiber to get what exactly we wanted so we had to buy single strand optics they were bi-directional optics but we got what we needed and again all we had was just enough to get some fiber somewhere or something but the pathway was the key thing and in in a lot of cases that made or broke our budget because getting from point A to point B, if we had to go through and do this trench or we had to do this crazy bore, but, you know, this bore was going to cost us 50000 as opposed to, well, you know, 10 years ago when we first did it, if we'd have put one more piece of introduct in, that would have cost us maybe $10,000 then. Right. It's now you have to dig another truck up to dig another trench. And, and that, you know, that, that same aspect, by the way, I learned the pull string rule. <laughs> from my own stupidity, I was doing work at uh, Office of Naval Research on a Friday afternoon, doing the last run of the day, and I forgot to put in my my pull string. And it was the last run of the day. It was actually the last run of the project. I was like, "Yeah, 
I don't care. Next Monday morning, I had to pull another run on that exact same pathway, and I was kicking myself for not leaving that pull string. But and and, and it's simple when you think about. I use the J hook as my example, right? So if you go to you know from the from a small J hook to a medium J hook. You're not talking that big of a price. I mean, the only difference you're talking about is just the price of the actual J because the labor factor to put in a small J hook is going to be the same labor factor as a bigger J hook. Yeah, right? it's so, going from a like a 12 to a 24, 24 to a 32, and a 32. Yeah, 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 exactly. So you, you never, never just put in enough pathway for today. You always got, you always going to be thinking, you know, the average lifespan of a structured cable plant can be. Well, they say seven to ten years, and that's because of technology driving stuff like that. But I know of some customers who are still using cable for POTS networks for, you know, credit card swipes for 20, 25 years, you know, and they might add on to that. So always always think about that next person because you never know that next person might be you. Yeah. <laughs> Just learn that, one, learn that one the hard way. Learn that one the hard way. Here, here's, my, here's my final question for you right here. So we're both RCDDs. We're both technicians, right? How can we educate others about the critical nature of these three essential components we talked about today? Besides writing the article, because you've already done that. So what's the next one? Next one is spread the good word. Fight the good fight. I mean, I, I, I still fight with architects, engineers, and consultants to this day. Um, they have their own set of challenges that they have to overcome and as it has been for the past 40, 50 years, telecom is not one of the noble trades, not one of the most critical trades in their opinion. Yes, so, it is. In my, in my opinion, it is. Well, in their opinion. I said theirs, not ours. I know you did. you did. For us, we're one of the most critical. We're up there, you know, right underneath, right there with electrical, you know, um, in my opinion. Well, they, call, they call us the the third utility. The There was a name for it where – People don't realize how critical they are until their network doesn't work or their phone system right. doesn't work. I, I, I want to say it's, we're called the third utility. I remember hearing that term at a Bixi conference once or something, but I can't remember if it's the third or the fifth. Or, but we're they, like they, the, they, No, we're still the 20th utility, you know. That's what we are in, in a lot of folks. There are some really good, you know, um, architect, engineering, consultant firms out there that are they're getting it. They're, they're understanding, right. like, yeah, we really need to get out in front of this technology stuff because technology is the enabler. Right. Um, that makes a business work. You know, we, we could have a building that, you know, obviously has structure. It has sheetrock. It has flooring. It has all this pretty glass. It has all this wonderful stuff. But without technology, what are you going to do? You're going to sit around and you're just going to look at each other. Yeah. Because you, you can't work. You're just going to sit there and look at each other and go, oh, okay, what am I supposed to do now? The building's great. It's nice and cool. We got a bathroom that's, you know, whiz bang with fancy yeah. lights around the the mirrors and glass. And the, t the touchless faucets. Yeah, oh, well, we can't do anything. So we might as well just be sitting in a warehouse doing nothing. Oh. Yeah, yeah. We's a we's a low voltage industry. Generally speaking, we're not really thought of a lot during the planning phases of the of of a project where where the we architects involved and the G is involved. We usually are working directly for the end user and we're brought in as an afterthought. And then when we ask for, when they, when they, when they only gave us like one, two inch pipe as a sleeve, when really we're supposed to have, you know, three or four, four inch slot, like why, why, why do you, you know, it's, I tell people all the time, it's easier to change a line on a print than to move a wall on a construction site. Yeah. And if you can bring us in early in a, in a phase in a project, that's going to help you be happy. Have a more satisfied customer, and it, a lot of people don't realize is the whole when a customer, generally speaking, when a customer goes to build a building, they go get a loan, so they got to capitalize and then spread all those costs over years to, to you know, the the amortization scales, mm -hmm. and they never put us in there. That's right, always, and you, and part of the problem is you know in the overall scheme of a building of building a building. Telecom, even though it is it is extremely critical to the function of the building, represents a very small dollar amount of the overall yes. project. Right. So when these when these architects, engineers, they're looking at it and they see just a small little line item for technology, it's not important to them. It's not as important to right. them as this, you know, thirty five percent of the project's gonna be in I don't know, structural or, you know, twenty percent right. of the project's gonna be in concrete or whatever. When they see this little 
two, three percent. That's nothing but right. structure cabling or whatever. It's not important to them until it becomes important at the right. at, at the mid of the project where they don't have what they need and they're going, oh, oh, maybe we should have thought about this. There but even know. so, after all these years, it's like they haven't gotten it. They're getting better. They're getting, getting better, better, but it's, getting it's still an uphill battle most of the time. Absolutely mm-hmm. is. Absolutely is. Justin, thanks for coming on, man. It's a pleasure finally getting you on the show. And uh, let me know when you publish that next article. It's and coming. I'll take a look at that one, and maybe we'll uh, bring you back on. Have you uh, being right. a repeat guest? Happy to do it, bro. Happy to do it. That's it for this episode of today's podcast. We hope you were able to learn something. Make sure to subscribe so you don't miss out on future content. Also, leave a rating so we can help even more people learn about telecommunications. Until next time, be safe.